evening. I am um, Fred Harris, Director of the Institute for Research on African American Studies, and I would like to welcome everyone to the first plenary. Um, its title is Manning Marable Legacies and Lessons. Um, so you, I guess you guys know that we um, kicked off the event last evening. It was terrific. It was great. So if you missed it, it was a, it was you missed a treat. Um, but today. Uh, we have a full uh, schedule of activities. And so this morning, we're going to start um, with uh, several presentations. Um, unfortunately, uh, Professor Paul Bull it won't be able to make it, so Russell Rickford will um, present his paper in a few minutes. Um, I can say a little bit about him in a moment, but for those who are here, um, I want to introduce uh, Professor Eula Taylor, uh, a second to my left. She is Associate Professor of African American Studies at University of California at Berkeley. She is a prolific uh, scholar, um, and she is the author, among many books, of The Bell Garvey, The Life and Times of Amy Jacques Garvey. Um, we also have, to my immediate left, uh, Professor Rod Bush. He is Associate Professor of Sociology at, at St. John's University here in New York. Um, he is the author of several books as well, but most uh, recently, The End of White Rural Supremacy, Black Internationalism, and the Problem of the Color Line, which was published in 2009. Clarence Lussain, uh, who is Associate Professor, he's to my at the end of, of, the, of the table. Um, he is associate professor uh, at the School of Inter International Service at American University. He is uh, the author of many books. In fact, I don't know the Clarence know this, we sort of um, shared mentors. Linda Williams was my mentor, and I know you work with her at Howard University. And she, the late Linda Williams, and she would always say to me, do you know what Clarence was saying? He's like the most published <laughs> graduate student in the history <laughs> of the academy. Um, and so I'm glad to see him here today. So we're going to start off, uh, Russell is going to um, give the presentation by Paul Bull, who is a senior lecturer at, at Brown University. Uh, we're going to keep the, he's not able to make it, so he's given it in his uh, absence. We're going to keep the, the comments to roughly 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Good morning. So on behalf of Paul Buell, uh, who apologizes for not being able to be here with us this morning at this historic event, his words, not mine, historic event. Any left-leaning activist, historian, and writer over 60 in the United States would have crossed paths with Manning Marable more than once during the course of the last 30 or 40 years, and more so the speakers at this conference, whatever their age. Each of us has nevertheless had some unique element in our contact. My short paper is entitled Manning Marable and C.L.R. James, a logical connection because having been the publisher of the James Anthology as an issue of my new left journal, Radical America, in 1970, I was lucky enough to bring James's wide-ranging work back to a new generation of radicals in all hues of skin color to at least a scattered readership beyond the U.S., in Canada, the Anglophone Caribbean, and the U.K. And luckier still to have been James's authorized biographer in a curious circumstance that found Manning to have been approached by the same publisher about at the time in part, no doubt, because Manning had been a major contributor to C.L.R. James, his life and work, the first anthological book of essays on the great octogenarian Pan-African figure. This latter work began as a special issue of the journal Urgent Tasks, myself as issue editor, and the contributors, a dozen or so writers intimate with James, including some who had worked most closely with him for decades. Manning was the youngest in the volume, the outsider who had become an insider in a brief time. Forgive me if I preface my remarks with one, one more personality that Manning and I shared, Tim Hector, the left-wing political leader and newspaper editor in the small island of Antigua with a considerable following across the region. Tim died young, age 59, 
and was not a book writer, but I consider him CLR's finest disciple because he not only led a movement, but also wrote widely about politics, literature, philosophy, music, and sports. Every issue of his weekly, The Outlet, had wonderful prose in the, in the Jamesian fashion, the projection of a new and better world within the shell of the old, largely rotten one. Manning had set out to write a history of the African and Caribbean left, hopeful but sober in its evaluations of failures, and he naturally got together with Tim for an extended conversation that must have lasted until Tim's death in 2002. And I have one more seemingly different story to tell quickly. CLR James's lawyer and friend from the 1940s, Conrad Lynn, gathered with myself and several others on a panel at the Schomburg a few months after CLR's death. He described meeting Malcolm in prison because he was Malcolm's lawyer as well, giving him a seemingly obscure pamphlet by CLR published by the Trotskyists and receiving the enthusiastic response of a brilliant autodidact. Thanks to Lynn, he said modestly, Malcolm discovered CLR, a black man as smart as any white man on the planet and a black man who understood the subtleties of left-leaning black nationalism. Manning Marable, working his way toward his own unique place in the left and in the African-American community, was closer to the traditions of the popular front, exemplified in Freedom Ways magazine and Harry Belafonte, thanks to James or, than to James or Malcolm X. His extensive work on Du Bois establishes Manning within that tradition more decisively than anything that I can say here. But it distinguishes his standing with another tradition, not in the slightest, as CLR and Tim understood perfectly in their avowed admiration of Marable. What Manning did, among the many things that he did, was to place varied traditions within a larger framework, in touch with each, of other, with each other through himself, his writing, and his political work. He did that as no one else could do it, and not only as a theorist and teacher. It is of great importance to us today that he also did this early and late as a popular writer, a journalist who appreciated sports, music, and popular culture at large as the wide horizon within which left-wing movements existed and made sense. I think that his reading of CLR's Beyond a Boundary, still perhaps the finest book, or at least the best written book, connecting sports history with the rising of people of color against colonialism, may have been decisive for his own development, or rather, he was already moving in that direction, and his reading confirmed his own sensibility, just as his reading of James's Black Jacobins, for a long time practically the only James text widely available, must have been significant, perhaps crucial, for the view that black people created the wealth of the West in slavery days, and given the opportunity, freed themselves. At the very least, this would be true for Marable's groundbreaking work on the left-wing movements and personalities from the African homeland to the Caribbean diaspora. When Manning published The Fall of Kwame Nkrumah in the collection of essays on CLR, the text that made up CLR's Nkrumah and the Ghana Revolution had not long been published. Manning clearly relied upon James's insights and experiences, adding his own to the key story in the early downfall of many of African revolutionaries' best hopes. Following criticisms that James had issued only in private and in person or by letter to Nkrumah's inner circle, Marable keenly noted that the separation of the party leadership from the mass movement had been terribly decisive. The role of the British and Americans in seeking to overthrow Nkrumah was an underlying cause but not the only cause. The cult of personality, so often derided, was an after effect. The suppression of dissent, the jailing of dissenters, brought CLR's appeals to Nkrumah for a reversal of direction, but it was too late. If Nkrumah, whom James had trained, some in the US, was listening at all. This was a story told with a variation of details again and again, and which Marable followed with great care in his volume. On James's home island of Trinidad, something analogous took place with James himself on the scene, 
trying to build a real leadership party around his former students. Dr. Eric Williams in the post-independence period and failing because the political sclerosis, another word for the desperate seeking of rising bureaucrats to live personally like the white American middle classes and protecting themselves from the criticism of ordinary people still suffering from colonialism's effect and understandably upset at the sudden arrival of neo-colonialism. There's a further connection between CLR and Manning Marable, and probably everyone in this room will recognize the personality who epitomizes this connection, the great revolutionary historian, activist, and martyr, Walter Rodney. The dismay that CLR felt at the news of Rodney's assassination was matched only by his dismay, at first disbelief, at the catastrophic events in Grenada, marking the end of a whole phase of the Caribbean left. Marable's How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America was a clear successor to Rodney's signal volume, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Africa, a volume that owed enormously to James without being in any way less original. There's also a wider significance here, one part tragedy and another part triumph. It was a commonplace for some Marxists during the 60s and 70s to bemoan being born too late for the CIO and the heightened class struggle of the immediate post-Second World War years, when capitalism had seemed in serious disarray, city general strikes broke out, and surge of black struggles seemed to promise an early resolution. We editors around the journal Radical America, along with others, were looking to the struggles of a remade working class now more black, brown, multilingual, and multicultural, as well as being more gender balanced at the points of production and distribution. The moment seemed to arrive in the very late 60s and early 70s, then recede. Capitalism more than survived. The Thermidor had set in, although we were in denial for a decade. Manning Marable, some years younger than myself, caught the tail end of this moment. At a tender age, he made himself responsible in the largest scholarly and political sense for a generation or two passing out of existence and for great social movements of enormous promise passing by as well. He lived, so to speak, within the reality of defeat for most of his scholarly life. Certainly his life as a distinguished scholar. So did I, so have I, and so have many more here. The triumph, however, is to have provided the linkage to the generations that follow. Marable was not only hailing heroes and heroic movements, but making the hard judgments that radical promise for the future demands, and to which few are bold enough, determined enough, to respond fully. I want to close by pointing to efforts that we made after 1980, successes in political mobilization that we did not have, perhaps because of the collective failure of nerve or experience, more likely the heavy odds against our success in using our political legacies for that envisioned breakthrough. One that brought Manning and myself intimately together was the effort in 2006 and 2007 to relaunch Students for a Democratic Society, and alongside it, an older brother and sister, the Movement for a Democratic Society. This project bore indirectly upon another effort a decade earlier, scholars, artists, and writers for social justice, growing out of the palace revolution at the AFL-CIO and the sense of Bill Fletcher Jr. and others that a moment had possibly arrived for labor progressives to step forward and rebuild a progressive coalition. If that earlier effort had gotten further, Manning, along with Bill, would have been major figures in it, I am sure. It got no further than a series of promising public events. New SDS reached somewhat further with campus locals in dozens of locales, in tune with the rising discontent over Bush's wars and the poverty of the Democratic Party's appeal to young people. I think, in closing, in retrospect, that such a young campus movement might not have survived the 2008 Obama campaign, just as a differently led SDS might have been swept away if Robert Kennedy had lived to win the presidency, in retrospect, that sounds pretty good, 40 years earlier. As it was, this version of SDS stumbled badly and lives on in scattered locales without noticeable impact. In the adult version, MDS, I nominated Manning Marable for the position of the national chair. He obligingly accepted 
here in Manhattan at an event at the New School in early 2007. One more splendid idea that did not happen. Perhaps MDS seemed too 60s. But that he was game for this responsibility when he had so much other work pressing him from all sides. That was typical of Manning, had been typical of Manning from the earliest days when we made contact and went on as long as he lived. For this, our gratitude is never ending. The words of Paul Buell. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, because it's early and I know it. So I really appreciate that you're here. Um, today, um, my talk is on the Black Radical Congress a perspective from the Bay Area. And um, I'll just begin with that. On the wall behind the cluttered desk in my office is a poster celebrating the June 1998 inaugural meeting of the Black Radical Congress. Held at the University of Illinois at Chicago, June 19th through the 21st, the names of the initial supporters are printed in a light gray color. From a distance, they fade into the background of the poster. However, my students can easily read from afar the red lettering announcing the Black Radical Congress, a meeting to set a black liberation agenda in the 21st century. Occasionally, some will, someone will ask me if I was there, which always makes me smile. I don't remember how I found out about the gathering, but I will never forget the excitement of being among nearly 2,000 people who identified with the black left. The people in attendance were uncompromisingly pro-labor, anti-racist, and proudly feminist. Um, it was here that I learned that the conference was the brainchild of Abdul Akaliman, Bill Fletcher, Leith Mullings, Barbara Ramsby, and of course, the man who we are honoring this weekend and celebrating Manning Marable. Jamala Rogers, our last national organizer, remembered that on March 17, 1997, she was called to duty by these five intellectuals. She said that, quote, the Fab Five, as she affectionately called them, proposed a gathering of forces from across the spectrum of the black left. Expanding from this core were other committed activists, eventually forming the National Continuations Committee, who took the responsibility of taking the process to the next level. And the next level began at the 1998 inaugural meeting. Here I found myself drawn to the Black Feminist Caucus. I have to confess, meeting the legendary activist Frances Bill, who happens to be here today, was the highlight for me. Of course, I knew her iconic essay, Double Jeopardy, to be black and female, and her work in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and the Third World Women's Alliance. Fondly known as Fran, she was thoughtful, sincere, and so approachable. Collectively, the Black Feminist Caucus was a wonderful mixture of young college students, neophyte academics like myself, noted scholar activists, and seasoned freedom fighters who had participated in the 60s and 70s liberation struggle, both in the United States and abroad. After watching the Million Man March on C-SPAN in October 1995, and the reactionary politics, particularly assaults on women and children by the Clinton administration, which had appropriated the conservative Bush agenda, it warmed my heart to be among folk with pro progressive politics. At the end of the meeting, I knew I had to participate in the BRC. Let me preface my comments by saying that I never held an office in the BRC, nor did I know about the inner workings or confidential communications on the national level. I count myself as a rank and file member, committed to building an organization in the Bay Area. We were a small collective, but our strength was our political education efforts and our ability to quickly build forces in support of Bay Area struggles. We met at Mosswood Recreation Park and Center located at MacArthur and Webster in Oakland. Cassie Lopez, an active member of the BRC, was on the, port, on the park's advisory committee and she obtained the space for us. Our standing meeting date was the second Saturday of every month. When we had upcoming events, we met more frequently. 
Mosswood was our central was central to the BRC's local um, for many reasons. First, there were always activities going on at this park, from pickup basketball games to little league baseball games to African dance classes and arts and crafts. It also hosts a number of important spring festivals, giving us a chance to table. Um, and to provide literature and to stimulate face-to-face -face conversation about the BRC. But life can get in the way sometime, and it's understandable that one might not be able to attend every meeting. But with the standing date and time of 10 to 1230, you could easily return when your time permitted. The once a month meeting became part of our routine. Questions of concerns or points of discussions were circulated in advance of the meeting. Sometimes we would grab lunch to continue our discussion. And my goodness, we had so many brilliant meetings in our local, uh, brilliant activists, excuse me, in our local. From Fran Bill to Correga Hart, from Phil Gardner to Margaret Gordon, there were so many wonderful voices there. A good chunk of our local organizing committee were seasoned intellectual activists from the ranks of unions, anti-poverty workers, teachers, women of color collectives, and college students. I really grew to enjoy the dialogue because I was learning, I was thinking, and I was receiving an awesome political education. Our LOC gelled relatively quickly after the meeting in Chicago because the first National Continuations Committee was slated for the West Coast in October of 1998. I don't know why the Bay Area was selected over Southern California, but once it became clear that we would serve as the host chapter to the other three regions, we had to put it in gear. The Department of African American Studies at UC Berkeley was the site of this working meeting. I told my department chair, Percy Henson, that we needed to, um, the support of the department and for facilities, including um, the use of rooms, Xerox and fax machines, and of course computers and printers. This is before the popularity of laptops and iPhones, um, so basically we needed to have these um, materials, if you will. Um, he quickly said to me, okay, this is Manning's group, right? And I said, yes, and we moved forward. In hindsight, what is clear to me is that Manning had already clearly stamped his presence on this budding organization. He understood the powerful possibilities of academia, particularly in providing resources for a movement, and working with mass movement activists committed to social change. Manning was rare in this regard, but he was not unique. We can reach back to W.E.B. Du Bois or even the understudy Joanne Robinson, who was connected to Alabama State College helping to facilitate the Montgomery bus boycott. Unlike many contemporary academics, Manning was able to carve out a political life that both informed and directed his academic work. Clearly, this is an important legacy of Manning, which also um, provides an important lesson for us as academics. That is, we have to push away from thinking that our academic work is separate from our political work. Or stop believing that political work is not beneficial because it fails to gain a certain kind of professional traction. The more we understand the relationship and the cross-fertilization of ideals and practices, our work will have real meaning for our communities beyond the ivory tower. At the first National Continuations meeting in Berkeley, the work was hard, confrontational at times, but exhilarating. We put our heads together to build, to rebuild, excuse me, a radical left movement. In addition, to, in addition to electing officers, we proudly began to pound out the freedom agenda and the principles of unity that were later ratified at the Baltimore meeting in 1999. The BRC National, uh, at the BRC National Council. These documents distilled the BRC's thoughts and objectives as an organization. The Freedom Agenda had 15 mandates, the first being, quote, we fight for the human rights of black people and all people. Moreover, that we affirm that all people are entitled to a safe and secure home, employment at a living wage, free quality health care, and free quality public education. These documents affirm that black people with different points of views, coming from different political sectors, could come together and generate a common agenda. We also elected representatives at the Berkeley meeting, and Frances Bill from our LOC um, agreed to serve as the national secretary. She was the perfect choice because she was a journalist for the San Francisco Bayview newspaper, which she used her column to introduce readers to the BRC campaigns, from educate, not incarcerate, to our protest against racial profiling. It was also at this meeting that Art McGee would be, um, 
that I would meet Art McGee, who would eventually become the BRC's internet communications coordinator. Before change.org and other cyber sites, the BRC maximized this medium. In fact, in January 2001, we won an Independent Media Institute New Media Heroes Award in a tie with EnviroLink and Green Marketplace. This award honored those who made a significant impact using the new media for social change. Thus, an important legacy of the BRC, which is clearly also Manning's legacy, was that we were ahead of the curve when it came to cyber organizing. Francis Bill and Craig Hart were, the LOCs, were, were our LOC's driving force, linking us both to the national campaigns and providing analysis on local happenings. In a 1998 memorandum to our LOC, Fran Bill proposed that we concentrate on popularizing the freedom of agenda with the goal of, quote, winning thousands upon thousands of people to endorse its perspective, and then to use these endorsements as a battering ram, I love that, a battering ram, to compete with the capitalist trickle-down perspectives and accommodationists that had dominated the political and social life of black America, end of quote. So our signature contribution in the Bay Area became political education. We hosted a lot of forums because we believed that everyday people would be spurred into action with information. Um, we did our best to spell, spread the freedom of agenda. We held forums throughout Berkeley and Oakland, both at the Humanist Hall and La Pena Cultural Center. We also worked closely with other groups, like the Women's of Resource um, uh, Women of Color Resource Center. Uh, we worked with the um, Justice for uh, Racial Justice Coalition um, in terms of, of sending a, call, a contingency to Sacramento to protest against racial profiling there. We also worked um, with the United um, Black United Front in Southern California to demonstrate against the 2000 Democratic National Convention. Local happenings did not escape our vision, and we decided to endorse Wilson Riles for the 2002 ca um, campaign for mayor in Oakland. Riles, who had been best been remembered as a chief advocate for the Oakland anti-apartheid policy, ran a campaign for affordable housing, education, peace, and economic justice. We hosted several um, um, Meet the Candidate events, um, and the campaign was good for us, especially for the younger people who really wanted to put their feet to the pavement. It was difficult for our LLC, I must admit, to keep younger activists involved. And I think the campaign, which required us to meet a little bit more regularly and perform a variety of roles, engaged them more fully. We held house gatherings and small forms to meet our candidate as well. I have a couple more minutes. Okay. No. Um, at the end of the campaign, Riles fa um, failed to defeat Jerry Brown. <laughs> Riles had some very good ideas, but I must confess that I think he lacked a traditional kind of charisma. But his campaign manager was his daughter, Brianna Cole, and she was a dynamo. At the end of the election, I was convinced, along with other members of the BRC members, that she actually should have been the candidate. Okay. <laughs> Thoughtful, energetic, with a contagious enthusiasm, Brianna gave me hope. Even though the BRC is now defunct, we still need support of black, we, need, we still need to support the black left, radical organizations, coalitions, and networks. I'm not sure why we, fought, why we f never fully connected with the masses of black people in the Bay Area. You know the black people who still had roots in Louisiana and Texas, the black folks that still ate fish consistently on Friday, attended the Eastern Star meetings on Saturday, and church on Sunday. We were unable to fully capture the attention of black people in the Bay Area, and it has left me wondering how do we build a, a black left mass movement? How do we popularize radical politics as a mass-based alternative in our communities? As the former national organizer of the BRC, Jamala Rogers, um, clo as, as the former national organizer of the BRC, Jamala Roz Rogers is currently closing um, the St. Louis office. Um, and basically, our support is still needed. From my correspondence with Jamala, she shared that Manning had talked about hosting a summation event of the BRC. We all had different perspectives of the BRC, mostly framed, about, framed around how we encountered it and our expectations of it. A summation gathering can help us move forward as we look backward on the BRC. Um, I have envelopes with me if you're interested in supporting this conceptual need. 
It is difficult for me not to feel nostalgic when I think back on the inaugural meeting and my eclectic days in the BRC local. It was work that was intellectually stimulating and exciting. The poster in many ways is like an old familiar song for me. You know when you hear a song from back in the day and you begin to hum and recall the lyrics, it makes you feel good and it usually ends too soon. The BRC is an old song for me because it ended too soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fred and uh, Eula, for your uh, wonderful introduction remarks. And thank you so much for organizing uh, this conference. It is absolutely necessary uh, that we pay tribute to the work of uh, Dr. Manny Marable, uh, but also that we continue that work. And this is exactly what Manny would have wanted us to do, was to come together, have these, have these discussions, have this um, framing for this opportunity to do analysis, uh, and then also to move forward. I've been asked to talk about race and Cuba, uh, specifically to talk about the legacy and the significance of a trip that Manning organized in 1997, where we took a delegation to uh, Cuba for about 10 days. Now, many of us know, of course, of Manning's um, uh, prodigious work writing about race in the United States, but Manning, of course, had a global vision. And he was concerned about and wrote about, but was also engaged in activities globally around issues of racial justice and issues of racism, from the UK to South Africa to Latin America, including Cuba. Manny put together a delegation of 15 of us in 1997, I believe it was in June, uh, to go to Cuba. And that trip followed a long tradition of African Americans visiting Cuba since the revolution. In fact, only one year after the revolution came to power in 1959, a delegation of Amari Baraka, uh, Juliet uh, Mayfield, Harold Cruz, and John Henry Clark were invited to Cuba uh, in uh, the summer of 1960 to meet with the Cuban leadership and to talk about a range of issues, uh, including issues of race. Our trip uh, followed in that long tradition, and we were able to go down and have meetings with a wide array of Cuban leaders, uh, people who were in the working on the economy, people who were working on a range of issues, but we also were able to meet with uh, Cuban academics uh, and people who are active around other issues. We also had the opportunity to spend some time with Asada Shakur, who was, uh, who's in Cuba, and we were fortunate to meet with her and have some extended uh, discussions. The delegation had four objectives. One was to look at the issue of gender. Secondly, to look at the impact of the introduction of market reforms in Cuba. Third, to look at the issue of the future of socialism and politics in Cuba. And fourth, of course, was to look at the issue of race. It's significant that we went in 1997 because we went in the middle of what the Cubans call the special period. And that was a, a critical time in the transition in Cuba in generally, but particularly what was happening with race in Cuba. And I'll go into that in a little bit more uh, detail, and that's really the focus of my discussion. Now, I want to uh, position myself in the realm of this history. I began to go to Cuba in the mid-1970s. Uh, I and the Cuban Revolution were a lot younger uh, during that time, and we had a lot of growing up to do. And I went back to Cuba in the 1980s, in the 1990s, in the 2000s, and most recently, I was in Cuba last summer where we had a conference that in fact was somewhat of a um, uh, commemoration of the visit that we did in 1997. And I was in Cuba earlier this year. I took students down uh, for two weeks for a study session that we have had at the University of Havana. So my uh, relationship with Cuba has not only been from trying to read and study and analyze Cuba from the outside, but also to try as much as possible to be on the ground and to be engaged with Cubans who are uh, discussing and working around this issue. 
it's important to look at Cuba in various different periods. There are basically three broad periods from the beginning of the revolution, 1959, up through the end of the 60s, when the revolution was uh, strengthening itself and surviving from the early 1970s up to the 1990s when the Cubans were, when the Cuban revolution consolidated and then the post-1990 period when the Cubans have had to make major adjustments because of the fall of the Soviet Union. It's really in that second period where the situation of uh, Afro-Cubans really kind of matured because that's when the revolution was in the best position uh, to make advances. And then we've seen dramatic changes uh, since that period. Uh, I want to make five quick points uh, about race in Cuba and situate that in the context of Manny's involvement and Manny's perspective uh, on the Cuban revolution and particularly on uh, race in Cuba. Uh, first, the issue of race uh, first point, the issue of race has always been a point of discussion in Cuba. From the time when it came to power in 1959 and Fidel Castro gave a speech in which he said, quote, one of the battles which we must prioritize more and more every day is the battle to end racial discrimination. All the way up until 2011, last year, when Raul Castro, in a speech before the Six Party Congress, noted that the party must grow and it must include more women and more blacks in the leadership of the party. Those acknowledgments from the top of the party and from the top of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution acknowledge race as an issue within the framing and growth of the Cuban uh, Revolution. But those acknowledge acknowledgments also do not address the kind of policy that is necessary and was necessary in the long term to really bring the, to reality the issue of race equality in Cuba. But that discussion has happened consistently and ongoing among Afro-Cubans themselves. In some periods, in the early period, for example, that I talked about, that discussion mostly happened on the down low. It ha mostly happened underground because you could not have these open discussions in Cuba about race. In the second period, the period from the 70s up through the, 19, up through the uh, beginning of the 1990s, there was some opening around having discussions about race in Cuba, but there were absolutely no specific policies coming from the Cuban government, and in that sense, it was kind of a no-no. However, since the period of the special, uh, since the special period, there actually has been an opening. And when we were down there in 1997, the fact that we could actually even come down and have a discussion, have the kinds of meetings that we had, was because we had these kinds of openings uh, in Cuba. Manny was very uh, clear in that the point of our coming down was to not have the party line, but to have us have discussions with a whole range of people, some who were in favor with the party, some who were not, but who were all trying to grapple with this issue of race. And the Cuban government said, well, okay. And so we were able to sit down with a number of people and have very frank discussions. Now, in that period, different from now, you did not have websites, you did not have publications, you did not have academics, for example, who had the free will to do research and write about Cuba, which exists now. But in 1997, there was an opening, and that was a really important kind of development, and Manny was very much on top of that in bringing our delegation down. Uh, point number two, it's critical to look at what the revolution achieved and what it did not achieve in terms of uh, race in Cuba. Uh, coming out of the trip to Cuba, a uh, special issue of Souls was uh, produced, and in this, Manny writes, in retrospect, it was literally impossible for the new revolutionary government to erase hundreds of years of racial inequalities and injustices in the span of several months or a few years. Now, that was important because there were things that the revolution did achieve that benefited Afro-Cubans, not in a specifically direct targeting of Afro-Cubans, but the fact that it benefited everybody in society. So, for example, the access to education. Everyone in Cuba had access 
to education, which is why Cuba has the highest rank of literacy of anywhere in the Americas and more or less anywhere in much of the developing world. Cuba also created a national health care system so that everybody had access to health care, which was very limited in the period before the revolution. So in the areas where Cuba made advancements that have affected and benefited everybody, Afro-Cubans were able to benefit. In the areas where Cuba was limited by resources and other issues, for example, in housing and in, in uh, employment, then the disproportionalities and the disparities that existed prior to the revolution to a great degree, great degree carried over. There was some beating of that beating back of that in the second period, but when the special period was, became about, it slowed and in many instances stopped, and what we're seeing in some instances even reversing the trends uh, towards equality uh, in those different areas. And that was critical. Uh, I would also note, though, the Cubans, to the degree that they were not addressing some of these issues within the context of the Cuban Revolution, were also some of the most vocal uh, opponents of racism globally. And Cuba was long before the United States, long before many other countries, was speaking out against apartheid, speaking, about, uh, speaking out against racial justice around the world. Cuba, for example, was uh, one of the countries, uh, one of the maybe few countries, where official policy came out in support of Mumia. So there was a long history of kind of a conflict between what Cuba was doing uh, domestically but its leading progressive role uh, on an international scale. And Manny was one of the first people to kind of point out the role that Cuba was taking in leading some of these global discussions around uh, racism. Uh, the role that Cuba played, for example, at the World Conference Against Racism in Durban in 2001. Uh, point number three. The fall of the Soviet Union had unprecedented impact on Cuba. Cuba literally was on the verge of completely collapsing. Not only were, was hard currency unavailable, Cuba's, um, um, Cuba's trade policies basically were 80, 90 percent tied up with the Soviet Union. All of that fell apart. Oil, for example, uh, there was actually a discussion among the Cuban leadership, I think it was in 91 or 92, that they would try to uh, survive without oil. That they were, they were, we're gonna, make, we're gonna make nine million bicycles, we're gonna stop using oil. Fortunately, that discussion did not go anywhere because the government would have, fell, would have fallen within months. But that's how desperate Cuba was. Cuba looked at its choices and the choice it had to make was to go to tourism as a driver of the economy. It made a number of other choices, but the principal choice it made was that, that tourism would drive the economy. And the decision to let tourism drive the economy, to dollarize the economy, and some other changes have had a very devastating impact on the question of racial equality uh, in Cuba. Uh, three critical impacts. One is the dollarization. When we went down in 1997, it was shortly after Cuba said that we have no choice, we have to let the dollar in, we have to let these remittances come in. Remittances come to Cuba at about a billion dollars a year, mostly from white Cubans in the United States, uh, mostly out of Florida, going to their relatives uh, in Cuba. That had a very distorting impact, not only on the Cuban economy, but on race relations in Cuba as well. Uh, Manny came up with the term that we begin to use that the Cubans weren't happy about, that we call racist dollars. Because these dollars were distorting the ability of people to live their lives in any way approaching uh, uh, equality. And it's gotten actually much, um, uh, it's grown a lot since 1997. So one impact was in part because the Cubans uh, in the uh, mid-2000s uh, created a dual economy. And now there's a situation where there's a Cuban peso, which is what Cubans, most Cubans are paid in and, and use as their economy. And there's what's called the CUC, which is the Cuban 
uh, currency that's pegged to the dollar. And that's people who work in the tourist industry or people who are getting paid by some of these collaborative uh, enterprises, and the differences are out unbelievable. If you get paid in hard currency uh, or in the CUCs or in the dollar economy, you have a very different life. I was speaking earlier and I was telling Ula that the situation in Cuba now is that it's much more lucrative, it's much actually better financially to be a bartender than to be a doctor. Because if you make $10 in tips or $20 in tips in one night working at a bar, you've made as much as any doctor in Cuba. And so you've got people who are trying to get jobs in the tourist industry despite whatever skills they may have as a physician, as an engineer, uh, or otherwise. And as you can imagine, uh, the tourist industry itself uh, is very racialized in terms of who works in the hotels, who has access to driving cars, who has access to, to the tourists. The uh, second, the other item that's affecting Cuba is the decision by the Raul Castro government to cut 500,000 jobs out of the public sector. Those jobs are way disproportionate uh, Afro-Cubans. And it's unclear, uh, although the Cuban government is saying it will do this in a phased way, it's unclear what the end result will, will be as people are basically thrown into a private sector that's still emerging, that's still unregulated in many ways, certainly has no affirmative action policies at all, and will in many ways put people at uh, greater economic and financial risk uh, than we've ever seen. Uh, there are other decisions that are being made by the Cuban government. For example, the ability of people now to buy and sell properties uh, that will also have an impact uh, on these questions. Uh, point number four, all of these issues are being debated by uh, academics in Cuba. There are a number of scholars, uh, uh, Esteban Morales in particular, who are writing and publishing about race issues in Cuba uh, in very critical kinds of ways. Uh, most of the writings are in Spanish, so it's, if you don't speak Spanish or read Spanish, uh, it, they may be a little bit excess, inaccessible, uh, but a lot of that work is being translated. We're trying to get more of it translated. Uh, there are some who are writing in English, uh, and if you go to the Afro Web website, uh, and there are a few others, you can get a sense of the flavor of discussion that's going on in Cuba that's very different than uh, and almost impossible of what would have happened even 10 years ago. But now these doors have opened to a great degree. The conference we had in Cuba uh, last summer uh, saw just an outflowing of uh, discussions around these issues uh, that simply could not have happened uh, previously. Uh, the last point. Uh, Cuba now sees itself as having moved beyond the special period, that the economy is growing now, the Cubans are looking to try to diversify the economy, to move away from tourism as the driving edge, and to look at like medical technologies, for example, or some of the environmental innovations uh, that Cuba uh, is, is performing uh, as ways to also uh, build the economy over the next number of years. And, and I do believe actually a lot of that will be successful. Uh, that will uh, uh, help to a great degree to mitigate some of the issues that are uh, rising in terms of these racial disparities, but specifically the Cubans need to uh, focus on this concern. Uh, beyond diversifying the economy, they also have to address these issues of resegregation. Uh, particularly in terms of housing. If you go to Havana now, Havana looks very, very different than it did uh, 15 or 20 years ago. It looks much more like Park Slope or uh, Georgetown uh, than it looks, than it, than it's had, uh, than it's had, has in the past. And there are parts of Havana that look very poor, that look very dilapidated. Uh, and these are racially segregating parts of Cuba. Uh, and so the Cubans have had this pointed out to them. It's a table, it's a point of discussion, uh, but no policies have emerged. And uh, that's gonna be critical because that's really gonna shape a lot of what happens in the future. Uh, there's also kind of a resegregation going on in education. 
And by that, I mean everyone still has access to education, but because there are, so lim there are limited slots now, there are good schools and there are better schools and there are not so good schools. And getting into the really, really great schools, which give you access to party leaders, gives you access to some of these other parts of the economy, also have not been uh, addressed adequately by Cuba. And then the last thing is that as Cuba is opening up the private sector, uh, it also needs to address uh, racial discrimination in those areas. One has to do with allowing these private industries to develop, many of which are being financed by these remittances that are coming from uh, people's relatives. Those are creating a very uh, disparate uh, racial um, uh, economic structure. But also, there are no policies that exist whatsoever vis-a-vis -vis the uh, private sector enterprises that are coming into Cuba. So while Cuba's official policy is that we do not tolerate racism, racial discrimination is illegal, that is not forced or implied on these companies that are coming in, and already we're seeing that in many instances, these businesses are all white. And so Cuba has a lot to uh, address. I do think that the discussions are more open now in Cuba than they've ever been. Uh, it will be critical that those of us who are outside of Cuba stay in touch with what's going on there on the ground. Uh, too often, I think we have focused on Cuba, but not been in touch with the people in Cuba. Uh, the doors are open. Uh, Barack Obama's administration uh, changed the laws a uh, year and a half ago. And so you can go to Cuba now uh, to some degree with some relative ease. Uh, how long those doors are going to be open is a big, giant question mark. Uh, so I would suggest you buy your tickets as soon as you can uh, and try to go and visit Cuba. But it's really open. It's really a good time to go and to, to address all of these issues. And again, I want to thank uh, Manning, who uh, in the early 1990s saw the need to go down uh, and look at these issues and then to come back and talk about and write about these issues. Thank you much. Good morning. Uh, I'm Rod Bush um, from St. John's University. Uh, that's how I identify myself these days. Um, this has really been a very emotional experience for me for a number of reasons. Um, one is my relationship with Manning. Uh, two is the stories that are told uh, about the Bay Area. Uh, that I recognize. I, I, I first met Clarence, I don't know if he remembers me, uh, in, I think, 1984 uh, in Cuba. And he was speaking Spanish. I was saying, wow, a black guy speaking Spanish. This is really impressive. I didn't speak a word of Spanish, so I was sort of lost. Um, and of course, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I know Wilson Rouse. I worked in the Wilson Rouse campaigns uh, in the uh, mid 80s. Um, and Fran Beal is here. Uh, and uh, I uh, wrote lovingly about her uh, in my last book, uh, The End of White World Supremacy, where I deal, to tried to deal with the issue of. of uh, uh, the black women's movement and uh, black feminism. Um, okay, uh, but I'm here to talk about Manning, uh, and I said my relationship with him was uh, complex. We were friends. Uh, I came out of the uh, left nationalist movement uh, that was associated with the Student Organization for Black Unity and the Malcolm X Liberation University. Uh, so I was uh, what Manning would call a black Maoist. Um, and um, I always joked with him about uh, the name calling. Um, but uh, we moved to, from left nationalism to a sort of uh, dogmatic uh, class is the major contradiction uh, in the world position uh, during the mid-70s. And, um, and it was Manning uh, who 
when I read his book, uh, From the Grassroots, uh, who pulled me back uh, towards uh, black nationalism. And so I, um, I was um, very impressed uh, with his book, uh, How, Capital How uh, Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America. Uh, I thought it was the finest theoretical statement uh, that I had seen uh, of the position uh, of black people in the United States and of black people in the world. Uh, so, um, oh, so my good brother comrade, um, I think reveals the unvarnished truth about the American imperial nation. And I think these are truths that we cannot back down from. Uh, I think that the capitalist system that has formed the horizons of the modern world since the 16th century is one that was constituted, uh, as um, Walter Rodney suggests, uh, by the conquest of America, the destruction and dispersal of the Indian, indigenous civilizations, and the enslavement of Africans as labor. Uh, so the uh, book, uh, how Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America uh, was consistent with the thesis uh, that uh, Walter Rodney uh, developed in How Europe uh, Underdeveloped Africa. Uh, these, were in, these were, in my view, uh, part of the same uh, process, and we forget that process at our own peril. Uh, because I think that in hindsight, uh, in 2012, uh, we see that uh, how capitalism underde underdevelops black America was prescient. Uh, it really uh, provided us with a uh, view uh, of a structural relationship uh, that um, was very central to the evolution uh, of the world. Now, um, when Africans, when the indigenous populations were dispersed and destroyed, uh, when Africans were enslaved, uh, when America uh, was conquered, uh, the concept of race uh, was invented to justify racism. And I want to argue that racism, uh, I'm, 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 I'll make a lot of enemies here, or at least a lot of people will disagree. Um, I want to argue um, similar to Manning, but with a different, a slightly different slant, um, that race was invented to subordinate a group below the regular working class. And that is what we see uh, throughout the world, that is what we see in the U.S., uh, particularly uh, with the, what Manning called the subproletarian strata. And I think that that concept is still important. I don't accept the concept of an underclass, although you can call it that, uh, but the underclass has such cultural poverty baggage uh, that I resist using the term. Uh, although my friend uh, Muhammad Ahmed uh, talks about the uh, black underclass uh, on a world scale. So, but, um, uh, but the uh, Manning's concept, I think, is really important. And the concept of underdevelopment uh, is really, really important because we can see the relationship between the racial colonial subjects uh, of European domination throughout the world because once the Europeans conquered America, uh, went through the process of enslaving Africans, uh, then they invented the concept of race, then they used the concept of race to justify their conquest of the rest of the world. And so that idea uh, of the superiority of the pan-European world or of the European world uh, was, has been central uh, to 
their own ideological justification uh, of world domination. Okay. Now, um, part of the problem that we have here, I think, in terms of our uh, theoretical and ideological and intellectual uh, understanding uh, is the what Marxists uh, call uh, the national question. And there are many people here who I see who's, who's written about it. Uh, Bill Fletcher back here uh, has written uh, very uh, intelligently about that issue. Um, but what I want to argue is that, and, and so the issue of uh, colonialism, uh, internal colonialism, has come to be described as an analogy of the colonial analogy. I want to, again, firmly disagree with that concept uh, because when we were enslaved, uh, we were brought here, uh, we were a colonized people. And it is not necessarily dependent upon the Black Belt Nation, uh, which the CP uh, line was for a time and, and the line of many of us uh, black nationalists, but it's, I think it's dependent upon uh, the fact that we were a colonized people. And I want to use the concept we are continue to be internally colonized so we can understand the relationship between uh, a people who are in uh, but not of. Now, uh, Cornell West criticized um, uh, Manning. He praised him. Uh, and then he criticized him for using uh, the language uh, of uh, um, uh, core periphery uh, and so forth. Uh, but I think that the use of the language uh, of, uh, of underdevelopment uh, really describes the way in which we are and continue to be uh, separated from and it's justified if you read a lot of the um, liberal uh, social scientists' uh, evaluation. Uh, it's very interesting looking at their evaluation of the Monaghan thesis. I don't know if any of you saw uh, the recent issue of the Annals uh, of the American Journal of uh, uh, Political and Social Science, uh, where all of the liberal, uh, left liberal social scientists began to, tr to try to look at what happened to Monaghan and, you know, poor Monaghan. And, um, and then they use statistics to show uh, the um, way in which the position uh, of black people was actually in decline. Um, and the, I think the problem uh, if they try to make that in, in trying to make it an issue of the attitudes of individuals, uh, either uh, our own uh, poor values, our culture of poverty and so forth, or, or the prejudices of whites, is that they don't see this as a structural phenomenon. Uh, Steve Steinberg calls it uh, uh, um, apartheid, occupational apartheid. And I think that is, uh, so the concept of internal colonialism, uh, the concept of uh, an underdeveloped black America that's structured into the system and the system depends upon it uh, as a way to elevate its role, uh, the role of European people, both internally and, on, and to justify it on a world scale. I think that that is a, uh, phenomenon that uh, we have to confront, that we cannot back away from, and so uh, uh, how capitalism underdeveloped black America uh, has been very important in my own development. Uh, I moved from sort of a black Maoism black, back towards a black nationalism, uh, but not a dogmatic black nationalism, uh, a black nationalism that's based upon resistance to imperialism. Uh, my friend Charles Pender Hughes calls it rather uh, anti-colonial Marxism. 
So uh, I'll accept that label. And, uh, but I think that uh, what Manning did uh, for us uh, was he really did, um, uh, uh, for some of us, uh, provide a uh, situation to, so that we could see the relationship between race and class. Now, um, Manning, uh, getting to uh, uh, Walter Rodney, uh, Manning uh, wrote a um, preface to the second edition uh, of the book. Um, and he argued that, um, he quotes Rodney. He says that it can be affirmed without reservation that, white race, that the white racism which came to permeate uh, world, the world was an integral part of the capitalist mode of production. Uh, European planners and miners enslaved Africans for economic reasons so that their labor power could be exploited. Indeed, it would have been impossible to open up the new world and to use it as a constant generator of wealth had it not been for African labor. Okay, this is Rodney speaking. Uh, Europeans uh, at home and abroad found it necessary to rationalize that exploitation in racist terms as well. Uh, oppression of African people on purely racial grounds became indistinguishable, indistinguishable from oppression for economic reasons. Okay? Um, and then Manning says, uh, the basic correctness of Rodney's emphasis of class above race became crystal clear with the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency in 1980. Now, I think that this skips too much. Now, I was part of, I'm about six years older than Manning, uh, part of the generation uh, that came up in the uh, debates within the African Liberation Support Committee. Uh, and I think that it's important to understand that there were the, the, the most of us were left nationalists and not Marxists. And so what has come to be known as a debate between Marxism and nationalism was actually more of a debate between left nationalists and more uh, centrist nationalists. And so uh, you remember that uh, Haki Matabuti uh, wrote a book called um, um, The Clash of Enemies. Was it? The Clash? The Clash of Enemies, okay? And um, that was uh, important. So um, what subsequently happened, uh, in my view, is that uh, some people pushed to uh, too hard, I think, against the nationalists. Uh, and uh, the debate should have remained, I think, uh, more of a united front uh, because you cannot uh, argue, I think, that black people should not be nationalists uh, because of the particularity of our experience. And so nationalists, nationalism is not in competition uh, with a struggle against capitalism. Uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, consistent uh, with a struggle against capitalism uh, because it's capitalism that gave us uh, the racist system of pan-European world dominance. And it is still a system that our people labor under. And I uh, have discussed this with Manning on numerous occasions. Um, and I I guess I'd never felt resolved uh, about uh, this particular issue. And I never felt comfortable with his, um, uh, I don't know, his preface to the second edition of how capitalism underdeveloped black America when he seemed to back down some. Um, and so I think uh, that what I wanted to do uh, to, in his memory 
was to come back and raise up how capitalism underdeveloped black America, because I still uh, think that it's the best analysis uh, of our situation, uh, both uh, domestically uh, and uh, on a world scale. Uh, and I think it gives us the tools uh, to um, plot a path forward uh, against a vicious system uh, that's destroying uh, our people, uh, that's uh, particularly our young people, uh, that's destroying people all over the world. Uh, and this dis destruction uh, is based on the racialization uh, of people who are not European. And so um, I, uh, take this occasion uh, to uh, praise Manning uh, and remember him, uh, and I miss him uh, very much. Uh, the, the kinds of discussions we used to have uh, on the phone uh, or on trips where I was taking him to speak somewhere. Um, I um, so. My point is uh, um, the urgency of the uh, notion of underdevelopment, um, and uh, that underdevelopment is continuing, uh, and if we don't stop it, uh, then who knows what's going to happen to us. However, I believe, I do not believe that uh, uh, in the long run, it can persist. I think that capitalism system is now in a period of structural crisis. And finally, someone uh, looked, uh, they have used, and you have to appreciate this, they have used us, uh, the people of color, uh, in particular black and Latino people, uh, as a justification uh, for the rightward movement uh, of the government and for right, the rightward movement of uh, many intellectuals. Uh, and the problem is not capitalism, but the problem is our culture, our lack of values. Uh, you know, it's important to see uh, that how disingenuous this is. And if you look at the intellectuals who began to say these kinds of things in the early 50s, uh, read um, The Mark of Oppression. Uh, uh, written in the early 50s. Uh, it's like money hand. And this came from people who had been leftists. And then to justify their movement uh, to the right, uh, the anti-communist liberals, uh, then they um, began to shift their analysis not on the problems of the systems, but on the problems of the, uh, the most oppressed uh, social strata. Uh, uh, in the system. And so um, in the 1980s, uh, when I came into academia, it was really strange to see uh, the students uh, all thought that Reagan was a good guy uh, and that he had promoted something called colorblindness and wasn't that good. And he wanted to focus not on special interests, but on the national interests. And uh, that sort of uh, discourse uh, is, reflects the change in the relations of force. But now, um, uh, someone finally pointed out the 1%. And I said, what? The 1%? Hey, that's a very important change. Uh, but the change is based upon changes in relation for, of force overall with the crisis of the capitalist system worldwide. And I think that if we uh, see ourselves as part of that uh, massive uh, group of people who are opposed to capitalism and can only be liberated and freed uh, with the pushing of capitalism into its grave, then I think that uh, Manning's uh, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America will have served its purpose uh, for me and hopefully for all of us. Thank you.
questions. I feel like I have to raise this question given the context of the uh, conversation we've had this morning. Um, Manning often talked about um, the importance of living black history. And I think we would be remiss, you know, as we remember him and, and remember and recall his work, um, that we don't, uh, that we, the need to link what's, um, you know, the discussions we've had this morning with what's happening right now today. And so, um, Eula um, gave a, this wonderful presentation about the Radical Black uh, Congress, uh, how it developed nationally and locally in Oakland. And it really raised this question about what is the meaning of black radicalism in the age of Obama? Right? How do we think in terms of, of this new vision that we're gonna um, discuss uh, throughout the, uh, the conference proceedings? Um, and within the context of that, I wanna get a little bit more specific. Clarence, um, when you were talking about Cuba, particularly the tensions between universalism and the need for targeted policy, that, I was really thinking in context of the tensions and discourse about domestic black politics, about the tensions between should there only be policies that help everyone, right, um, as opposed to those that are targeted um, in, in challenging racial inequality. So I want you to sort of link what you, your analysis in, in Cuba to what's, what you think is happening here in the United States today around race politics or black politics. Um, and, and Rod, um, uh, uh, you know, you talked about uh, sort of the structural crisis that's going on um, and uh, the view about, um, you know, the black people being an internally colonized people. Again, what does that mean within the context of having a person from the colonized um, to be uh, leading the American empire? So, um, okay. <laughs> Are you, you look, I think. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a really big question, and um, what is the meaning of black radicalism in the age of Obama? Makes me ask the question, where is black radicalism in the age of Obama? <laughs> As opposed to the meaning of it. I think that um, it is so, incredibly problematic that, you know, we haven't been able to collectively raise questions um, in a way that he feels like he has to respond to us um, during this period. I think that, you know, when, you, when there are certain kind of critiques of the Obama administration at this particular moment, you know, people are isolated, people are, um, um, taken off television, okay? <laughs> um, people are um, pretty much shut down. And it's almost like he's, you know, receiving these huge passes. Um, and it's almost if, you know, his black body is shielding him from a certain kind of, of critique of his presidency. And I don't have, um, the full answer to your question because I think at this point we are really, really struggling around how do we um, um, garner a certain kind of support to critique his presidency um, without being isolated or um, um, pushed aside or perceived as anti-black. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, actually, it's a very, um, a uh, timely question. Uh, I teach a course called Racism uh, and Ethnicity in the Americas, and actually we had our last class uh, last evening. And the class focuses on issues of race in the Americas, but I also include Canada and the United States, because they often kind of written out. And actually our discussion last night was, what, how do you frame Obama in relationship to Latin America? Uh, it boils down to a debate and a fight over perspective. And on the one hand, you have what some are calling, and I think appropriately, colorblind racism, 
that is a perspective that argues that we're in a post-racial era, that race is no longer a determinant in people's lives, that the issues that people of color face are due to cultural uh, and value issues, what kind of what Rod uh, affirmed to, uh, and that is really a predominant uh, perspective. And that's up against a perspective of racial justice that says that there is a responsibility on the part of society to make sure that everyone is included and that discrimination uh, and isolation, social isolation and exclusion don't exist. And those are really the two battles that are happening, but not just in the United States, but also in many other parts of the, of the black world. And we see that particularly in places where these states have argued that they have made progress and that they have resolved these issues. We, seen it, we saw it in Cuba, for example, although Cuba has now walked back on that. Uh, we've seen it in Brazil, for example. We've seen it in a number of different places. And so we're in an ideological battle over which perspective will shape the way in which public policy and society uh, will move. And that will become a very critical battle. Obama fits into that because Obama becomes the poster child for this argument of color blindness. And to the degree we don't unpack that and, and designate and clear, make it clear, A, that Obama, Obama's election wasn't a race-free election. And if you look underneath that, there actually was a, a significant racial dynamics. And that Obama's presidency is not a race-free presidency but that, in fact, if you look at everything from racial disparities uh, all the way over to institutional manners and ways in which race uh, continues to configure and, and continues to live, then that becomes what we really have to do. Um, how do I explain the rise of a black president uh, in 2008? Uh, in view of my understanding of the blacks as an internally colonized people. Um, I, I don't think that there's any contradiction at all. Uh, and I think that the point uh, of being an internally colonized people is one, that we are not subject to the uh, nationalism of empire and the uh, U.S. nationalism is a nationalism of empire. It's the nationalism of the pan-European white supremacist world. And so contending with that is them having to deal with a population uh, that is uh, rebelling and that is morally um, justified. And uh, this is something that Malcolm talked about uh, if you are not a part of their system, you are not getting your democratic rights, uh, then you are morally justified in rebelling. And I think that this moral uh, position, uh, this moral stance that we have, uh, is something that um, the white population, some segment of them, understand. And so um, uh, I think that the black liberation movement, the civil rights movement, have been a very important moral force uh, in the society. Uh, and the uh, way in which the focus of, uh, 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 was placed upon the culture of poverty uh, was a attempt to um, remove uh, the sort of moral position that we have to delegitimize us. Uh, and I think that that's a struggle. And I think that uh, Obama's victory in 2008 uh, was part of the accumulation uh, of that struggle, uh, despite what he stood for. Um, and I think that um, what happened when he won, I think, which I think clarified things uh, on a national and world scale, but certainly on a national scale, is that the far right saw this as socialism. 
And people say, no, they're just lying, you know. I think they are dead serious. And, and I think because we are in a structural crisis of capitalism, then the question is, where do we go from here? Which way forward? And the far right is they have their position, which is a racialized, militarized system uh, where they have their guns and they can shoot us down and they can threaten the president and that's okay. And that stops any sort of uh, center left, any kind of movement uh, towards social democracy. And, and you know, I, I think that's what it's about. But what it shows, I think, is that the system itself uh, is in crisis. And the, the, the far right is looking for an alternative uh, after capitalism which is a straightforward white supremacist, militarized government, um, you know, dystopian. It's, you know, so, so um, what do we have to do? Uh, uh, we have to fight, one, for immediate, uh, the immediate goals of the population and also uh, for the long range goal of ending capitalism. Are there any questions? <laughs> I did allow me um, very briefly to just remind us that we have almost uh, 15 minutes left. So it's wonderful that we're opening up because this has been a very engaging conversation and I want us to have some exchange before the next panel at 11 o'clock. I did want to um, very briefly just acknowledge um, a, a couple of people. Um, one of them is uh, Sister Frances Beale, who is trying to make her escape there. No. Um, <laughs> Gave me to the mic. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and uh, I have some of my students here from Dartmouth College, and almost all of my classes, um, we read um, Sister Beale's very, very important um, essay, Double Jeopardy. Um, and so it's an honor to have her here. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the anthropologist Leith Mullings, who is here in the first row, who of course is Dr. Marable's wife. Wave your hand, Leith. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and since, since I'm on the mic, let me uh, acknowledge very briefly my students from Dartmouth College. Would you all please stand up? They've made their way all the way down from New Hampshire, so can we acknowledge them? I think we speak. We we would like to get as many questions out as possible okay. before you respond, so that we can have a much more democratic discussion. And we, we did this yesterday, and it worked really well. Okay. I, I just think it's important to distinguish between uh, Obama winning as an individual and Obama as a representative of a class that operates on a global scale. And this is the administration that overthrew the government in Honduras two years ago that is currently occupying Haiti and Panama and Colombia and Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and that is running a war in, in Mexico. So it's not an individual. Uh, phenomena. We have presidents and we have experience in the Caribbean with black presidents and they're no better than their white uh, counterparts in Cuba, in Jamaica, in the Dominican Republic or, or elsewhere. So I would hope that the panelists would combine the issues of race with the issues of class and the class that Obama represents or the class that Obama is fronting for to be more uh, specific is the same class that's run this empire for the last 200 years. One other brief comment then is this. Uh, when uh, radicals from the United States or from Latin America go to Cuba, the Cubans are very polite and they don't ask the question that I'm gonna ask now. Uh, the, th those who criticize the Cuban revolution should go back to their countries and do it better so that the Cubans can learn from the experience of other Latin Americans or other people in the Americas uh, addressing these issues of race and class in a more efficient way than they have been able to do in Cuba or in Haiti for that matter for the last 200 years 
given the constraints of an occupation. And I would welcome the effort to do it better here so that the Cubans can learn from radical Americans. Okay. Francis Bill. Um, I want to make a, a short comment and uh, in leading up to the question. Um, the issue that Clarence has raised uh, around race has to do with how the Cubans perceived and are developing what we would consider more progressive ideas, moving towards an, a, a, a question of where policies are necessary to actively fight racism. Um, I want to relate the um, experience I had in Cuba in 1972. Um, I met uh, in the course of that tour, uh, I went down as a journalist for a radical journalist conference, um, a uh, black woman, middle-aged sergeant in the Cuban army. And when we raised some of these questions about what Cuba was doing, relative to race, she told me her story, which very briefly was that she was born into a family that uh, worked or didn't work, uh, was very, very poor. Um, when she was 13 years old, she stopped um, going to school. She was, Ill, um, you know, she had had some um, <clears throat> education, but she was Ill, uh, basically illiterate. And she said, what the revolution did for me is that here I am, a sergeant in the army. I can read and write because of the um, um, literacy campaign. And then tears began to roll down her face. She says, but my daughter today is going to medical school and is going to be a doctor. This is unheard of in my family. So the, the point is the revolution provided a road uh, even though they didn't take some specific um, uh, um, policies relative to that. And I think that bringing that lesson to the United States, just um, sort of ending Jim Crow at the pro forma level brought a number of blacks through the door of opportunity. And I think a lot of blacks stepped through that door of opportunity. So the question uh, in some ways also addresses the question of how race and class intersect in the era of Obama so that Obama essentially, in my view, is taking the same perspective as the Cubans. You don't do anything relative to race because the doors have already been open. Worse, I think that on racial issues, Obama is not good at all because I think he has made a deal in which they say, leave the racial issues to the side to the extent possible because if I become identified as, quote, a black president, that I will not be able to unify people, meaning the other, the other parts of the coalition. So the question in terms of this, how does race develop in the era of Obama and radical black America? The question is, how do we, given the fact of the rise of some fascistic tendencies in terms of the Tea Party, make a radical critique which doesn't serve that fascist growth at the same time? That is, I think, the thing that people have been trying to balance, and we have not come up with an answer up to this point. Yes, thank you. So we're gonna uh, take, we're running against time, one more question. Um, to the to my right, and then we're going to have a response. Okay, great. Because I have a three-part question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll make it brief. Um, it's so great to see Fran Bill, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm one of the original members in the BRC, and I joined in Chicago. And so, my questions are: one, how do you all think um, that the 
very prominent sort of anti-Minister Farrakhan stance, and that, that was, it was just a real prominent attitude, I suppose, and, and political stance, being that it emerged, that the BRC emerged in Chicago, how do you think that affected um, the relationship between the BRC and the NOI in particular, and just how black people were able to receive or not receive the BRC? Um, I'm sorry, the black, the black Radical Congress. And um, the second question is, especially, uh, particularly to Eula, the BRC, which is the Black Radical Congress, also um, purposefully created this feminist space where women were respected and were able to actually, to literally speak, where if you called on you know, a man, you were expected to, as moderator, to then call on a woman. Um, and it was also very democratic in the sense that everybody had 60 seconds to make their point and move on. Um, I wondered, and I, I experienced a lot of backlash uh, from particularly the nationalist camp um, around ideas of feminism in that space, and so I wanted you to address that. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, because I miss the BRC so much, it, it's really painful to not have the BRC today. So I guess I was just wondering if we were to do it again, um, kind of what, what do you think it would look like and how could we fix it for the future? Okay. Thanks. You know, we, we have a lot to digest here in a, in a few minutes, but um, we'll get to the uh, Black Radical Congress question, um, questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, do you want me to do, maybe I can add, um, get at one aspect of right. it and then we can kind of get all the, right. so, um, first of all, thank you for your comments and I totally agree. I totally miss the BRC and I totally love the Black Feminist Caucus section of it. Um, but. I'm just going to get to the last question because I think it's most important in terms of how do we fix it, how do we move forward for the future. And I think that one of the one, in my opinion, one of the way one of the things that we kind of missed is certain kind of like outreach to churches and er, other kind of like community sectors. And that's why I said, um, you know, I think for us in the Bay Area, you know, I think um, somehow we weren't able to galvanize people who. Um, you know, who are part of the Eastern Stars on Saturday, who go to church on Sunday, mm -hmm. who, you know, are active in certain kind of like local activities. And I think that, you know, somehow we have to figure out how to um, have them understand that this is good for them too, um, that, that a black radical political position is not only good, it's the best thing for them in this particular capitalist space. So I think that would be one of the things that I would kind of urge us to like engage more fully in if we were to kind of reactivate it. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, let me respond to a couple of the questions relating to, to Cuba and to Obama. Uh, two things. One, I think that there are multiple readings of Obama. Uh, both domestically and uh, internationally. And that's important because depending on where you sit, you may read what Obama means and signifies from a wildly different perspective than someone who's sitting uh, right next to you. I think it's absolutely true that Obama represents the state. He is the state. And his administration is carrying forth the policies of the American government as they determine those interests, not through the prism of race, but through the prism of the interests of those who control society. But that's not the only reading of Obama, again, either domestically or internationally. The international reading is important because for many states that are grappling with these issues of race, Obama is a godsend because he becomes an avatar for how they, they can project these colorblind possibilities on these societies. For many of the civil societies who are reading this, they're reading Obama as an anti-racism um, phenomena. For example, uh, I'm working on a book now that I call Globama, looking at the globalization of Obama, and it's looking at the ways in countries around the world that people responded in 2007, 2008, 2009. In Iraq, for example, there are people of African descent in Iraq, Afro-Iraqis, who, uh, who came out in support of Obama. In Italy, in Russia, in Costa Rica, in Canada, in Belarus, in all of these countries where there were people of African descent or people who were marginalized, 
they saw Obama in a very different kind of reading. In Brazil, for example, they have this law where people can run under any name they chose. There were eight people who ran under the name of Obama for office in 2008. All black, they all lost, but the point is that they saw this, uh, they read something in Obama from the outside that they felt would be useful in addressing their own kinds of struggles. And so I think there are you know, really complicated readings about how Obama gets fixated uh, around the world. But even domestically, you know, these issues are there. Obama and the colorblind coalition that would love to have that be the dynamic around race have a big problem. Their problem is they can't control people to the right and to the left of them. And so you got people on the right who absolutely are not buying this color blindness and who absolutely see Obama as the coming of the end of society, if not the end of Earth. And so they're organizing, they're mobilizing, and they're engaging at every level of political life and society. And then there are those of us who are to the left, who are not buying this at all, who said that there are racial justice questions in the society that have to be re addressed regardless of who's the president. And those have to continue, and we have to keep mobilizing, organizing, uh, analyzing, writing, and institutionalizing our struggle uh, around those issues. All of this will continue to be in the mix, uh, certainly as long as Obama uh, is president, uh, but long after Obama is gone and these legacy questions are there, we're going to still be fighting these battles, um, which I think are, are fine. These, these are the battles we have in front of us, and these are the ones we fight. But I think we have to recognize that there are multiple readings uh, of Obama and the Obama phenomenon. Okay. Just quickly, right. Um, I remember uh, what I thought of Obama uh, when he first started running. I said, here they want a black face to imperialism. Uh, and I still think that it's true. Uh, for them, they had no legitimacy with the folks who were in. Uh, and so here's a guy who could talk to folks. Now, yes, does he represent the US state? What else does the, com does the commander in chief do? Uh, but I think that the underlying issue uh, of us building power uh, is what we're trying to do. And I think that uh, to, to focus too much uh, on o Obama is, look, Obama is taking the classic position of William Julius Wilson, uh, which is to, what he tried to do is to fight for social democracy, uh, but uh, de-emphasize the issue of race. Uh, that's, you know, anybody who knows William Julius Wilson's work uh, that's what he advocated, been advocating for a very long time. And so social democracy has classically also been pro-imperialist. Uh, that's the issue with European social democracy. They supported imperialism. And all of the, con uh, the debates that we had over the 20th century uh, about imperialism, um, social democracy supported imperialism. So. We represent an anti-colonial force within the U.S. And although Obama, as a bourgeois, uh, represents a class, uh, he is also related to us uh, in terms of, uh, even if it's a face, it's the change in relations of force, the, um, the attack on racist oppression, uh, the attack on white world supremacy. Uh, and our population is changing. We're gonna be, be the majority. And so, um, you know, we should be looking towards that and we're incorporating more people from racial colonial subjects uh, from the global south into our population. This is gonna make a difference. I remember when I saw the vote come in from the southwest uh, in 2008. I said, God damn, now this means something. And because the right thought that they were going to get the Latinos on their, their conservative stuff, uh, you know, like they're going to uh, be um, anti-immigrant and still get support, you know, what kind of fools do you, you think they are? Uh, so anyway, uh, I think uh, that social democracy has 
been pro-imperialist, and uh, that's just what it is. And we're struggling to come up with something that's different. Our anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-heterosexist uh, stance. And that's what we're fighting for. Okay, uh, I want to thank the panelists. Um, Fred, yes. 30 seconds. Just 30 seconds. Okay. okay, I think one of the things that strikes me as unique about Obama, I refer to him as a neoliberal Keynesian. And this is something we have not seen within the state uh, in the last 50 years that you have a president who is a very clear neoliberal marketeer and pushing free trade policies and all that, but he absolutely is a Keynesian at the same time. And so I think, you know, there's some uh, interactions there that we haven't analyzed that I think is on our agenda. Okay, I want to thank the panelists and also Russell, um, you have some Yeah, a quick, a quick announcement. First, uh, a, a very warm thank you to the panelists for a very powerful conversation. <laughs>